So here's really how you capture recruiters' attention on LinkedIn. What are you looking for? No one wants to get, hi, I applied for this job, can you help me? That is not building rapport with a hiring manager or a recruiter. You have to do your research, be very professional, and honestly, just be nice and kind and understand that recruiters, the first question we're gonna have Brian and Kelly answer, are really gonna take you in the back round of what a recruiter does, how they look for you. Um, the more that you can be nice and show gratitude, I really appreciate your time to help me assess this company. Make that personal connection. Read everyone's actual LinkedIn profile that you are going to be connecting with. If it shows that they're part of a, a group that you're also a part of. I see that we're part of um, an association, or I see that we're connected to X number of people. Make sure that you are being quick and responsive. I heard a story, and I think, Brian, I'm gonna let you shine that story, the light on that story in just a few minutes. Brian has a very interesting story to tell you about LinkedIn. Um, if you are getting responses on LinkedIn, make sure you respond but you better be on your phone and you better be responding quickly because recruiters act fast, work fast and want responses from you. If it's 48 hours, 72 hours later, it's gonna be way too late for you. Make sure that you have LinkedIn premium. It's actually worth the investment. Sorry about that. It's worth the investment and I highly recommend that. So, Take a screenshot, take a snapshot of this. Brian and Kelly, who I'm gonna introduce now, are gonna go a lot more over these. But these are our nine tips very quickly for you. Be grateful, don't burn any bridges. Know what you're looking for and ask for help. Ask for thought leadership and information from them. Make it simple for the recruiter to respond to you. And then once you have built that relationship with the recruiter or the hiring manager, take the initiative and send in your resume. Absolutely take those initiative. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Kelly Ward to you. She's a recruiting consultant that has worked some amazing companies here in Denver. And Kelly, I'll let you take it from here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Kelly? Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I started my career off in outside sales. So would truly pull into a parking lot and cold call every place and got kicked out of so many places and then evolved into recruiting. And I've worked on the agency side as well as in-house with multiple startups. And then recently this year, I decided to go out on my own and start my own consulting. And right now I'm recruiting for a couple startups that are out of um, Canada and um, all throughout the U.S. So definitely have some global experience and I'm excited to talk to you today about the tips and tricks and what bothers us as recruiters that you may not know. And please, please, please ask us anything and everything. We are really here to help you. Thank you so much, Kelly. And I met Brian at Second Act Women's Career Camp. He did a whole presentation on LinkedIn on how that works. So our energies are just very connected, and I'm super excited to introduce um, Brian Kerr to you, who is a Senior Human Resource Partner at Uplight. Brian, tell us a little bit more about yourself, and we will take the conversation from there. Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you for taking time at your lunch break uh, to meet with us today and to talk a little bit about how career development works in this brave new job market it is definitely a brave new job market. I think we can all attest to that. Um, I actually am a liberal, I'm a liberal arts kid. I studied music and liberal arts in college back in the 90s and early aughts, and then kind of stumbled my way into corporate America. Um, so I started um, at Harvard Business School in 2004, 
uh, recruiting for um, all of the business lines, things of that nature. I did it for two years. Back when we used to fax resumes, I'm not sure if anyone on this call remembers <laughs> faxing resumes, <laughs> but but we used to do that. That was a thing we did. Um, and then after a couple of years, I was recruited to work at Berkeley College of Music, which is a huge music institution. And for about 11 years, I worked in New York City, Los Angeles, and Nashville in the commercial music hubs as the music industry was growing up and really becoming a technology industry. I think we can all agree that commercial music has really turned into tech and SaaS and different things like that with Pandora starting, and then of course, Apple Music and Google and all of that. So I did that for a long time. Um, but I really wanted to kind of get into the startup space. And so about four years ago, I decided to leave the music industry in Boston and move to Denver and work with different startups. And um, that's been really wonderful. In addition to my current role, which I'll get into in just a second, I'm also the chapter co-director of Startup Grind Denver. If you are in the Bay Area, you're probably familiar with Startup Grind Global. They're based in Redwood City. There is a, a chapter for Startup Grind in every major city in, in the world, which is exciting. It's very global, very international. And I am the chapter director for Denver. So I just love um, creating these events to bring different entrepreneurs and different people together in authentic ways. And so that's kind of a, a passion project for me. Um, my current role, I am now two years in at a high growth scale up called Uplight. And I was brought in after the merger of six companies and really there to kind of reduce the HR tech stack, work with our talent acquisition team, grow the company in, in very thoughtful ways. And I've been there for two years. So even though I'm not in a traditional talent role right now, I have worked in talent and oscillated throughout my career, but I am very much in a strategic senior HR uh, role right now for a scale up. So that's just a little bit about me. I'll take it back over to Shelly. So as you can tell, we've got some awesome speakers for you today especially from a startup technology and really seeing what's out there from a global perspective. Um, recruiters right now are in high demand because it is such a candidate market. Let me say that again, it's a candidate market. So we're gonna talk about what that means. Um, and our first thing that we're really gonna dig into is I want you as job seekers or our audience to really understand What's it like from a day-to-day -day perspective in the life of a recruiter? So Kelly, let's start with you. If you could take us on the journey of your day-to-day -day life. Yes, so there's definitely no standard day-to-day. -day. It will truly be changing every single second. So while I will definitely try and time block my day to sit down and make sure, make sure I'm sourcing for certain types of roles. And then I have all of my candidate interviews lined up and then, you know, different meetings going on. Things can just be changing like crazy. So the things that I try and never change are obviously candidate interviews. I want to be super respectful of time with my candidates. Also, I'm talking to you for a reason. Um, but you may walk on a Friday, the hiring manager or your boss will say, hey, we're going to hire five new recruiters. And then so my wheels are spinning. I've already tapped into my network over the weekend. And then on Monday, they'll come back to you and say, just kidding, never mind. We're going in a completely different direction. So you have to be super, super flexible and be able to pivot and not get like all wound up and think, oh, I just wasted all this time. Um, just make sure you're being super authentic, like with your candidates in your network and say, okay, this isn't it right now. Um, I'm going to keep in my pipeline. I'm actually having to recruit on these roles, um, but let's keep in touch. And so that's just very, very high level, but it's always changing and always, um, always something crazy, but in a fun way. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so Brian, when you were in recruitment and as a senior HR partner, tell us a little bit about what your life is like. Well, <laughs> um, working in HR right now in uh, 2021 is a very interesting time to work in HR. I think we all know with COVID-19 and this brave new job market that we did not notice a year ago, right? You know, I think a lot of us on this call probably were at companies where we were looking at doing reduction in force and layoffs and things of that nature because of the uncertainty of COVID-19. And now here we are, a year, you know, fast forward a year later, and we cannot hire candidates fast enough. Um, something that is really interesting is, you know, my, my team right now is looking to grow because we're looking to hire 200 more roles. 
Um, that is a lot. <laughs> they want to hire 200 more people by January 1st. So my recruitment team is definitely feeling the pressure. And Kelly, I don't know if I told you, but I just found out that we are hiring three more recruiters at, at my company. So that's exciting. I'm sure I'll be pinging you for, yeah, I'll be pinging you for some help. Maybe we can get you on as a contract recruiter. But anyway, so that just kind of shows you what's going on here. One thing I would like to say, kind of circling back a little bit um, to what Shelly had mentioned about the LinkedIn thing, I'm just going to be very authentic with everyone on this call. I get reached out a lot by recruiters because of my role and what I do. And I really dropped the ball the other day. I was in a ton of meetings and I look at my, I live on my LinkedIn iPhone app. It's the, it's the number one app. It's literally the only app I have notifications on my phone because if you do not respond immediately to recruiters, you lose out because they are definitely under pressure to go fast. I won't say the company, but a company that would have been a great company for me to consider for my next role in a role that would have been great. I completely dropped the ball on it. I did not get back in time and they moved forward with other candidates and I was kind of bummed about it. And, you know, I didn't take my own advice in that case. So if there's anything you learned today, it is making sure that your LinkedIn is on your phone and that if you get an in message, you respond within an hour. I am not kidding. I just got another ping. I have an interview at three o'clock with another company. Okay. So that's happening. It's happening fast. And it's because I got back to that person right away. And she's like, I want to talk to you at three o'clock. So at three o'clock, I have a call. We're going to see what that looks like. I've already sent my write up in my resume. We should get into that in just a minute. So if you learn anything today, it is please get back with these recruiters or anyone within an hour or two and make sure that you have your, um, LinkedIn on your phone. So that's like my number one takeaway right now. And learn from my lesson. You don't want, you know, to lose an opportunity. Um, op, you know, opportunity is not a lengthy visitor. So when it comes, you need to definitely capitalize on it. Kelly, can you tell me a little bit about the roles that you're recruiting for and what really pops out for you for candidates and what are your pet peeves? Let's go a little bit into that. Yeah, definitely. So, well, first off, I definitely agree with what Brian says. Um, the faster you get back to me or any other recruiter on LinkedIn, the sooner you'll be at the top of the line. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, my, my roles right now are spanning everything from a controller to a senior copywriter to recruiting coordinators to senior HR business partners um, to a paid social media manager, um, lots of product roles, lots of product designer roles, um, either on mobile side or just traditional. So um, I definitely have a variety of roles. I have honestly over 20 roles right now, and that is a lot. And so going back to kind of like the day in the life, um, there's so many things that are going on at one time that like I can definitely drop the ball. Um, in the, you know, maybe I said I was going to respond to this candidate and I didn't get a chance to do it because I'm just sometimes drowning. So that goes back to a couple of different like things that I wanted to um, also reiterate, just like kind of put yourself in a recruiter's shoes. We have so many things going on at once. So if a recruiter doesn't get back to you like immediately, it's different if it's an in-mail, um, well also kind of with an in-mail too. Um, but where I'm kind of going with that. The biggest pet peeve I have is when in the applicant tracking system, I want to talk to you. I send um, the link out and says, please give me a variety of times that you are available for the next two weeks. And I will also call it out that I may not get back to you within, or like give me 24 hours to get back to you. The biggest pet peeve is when candidates will literally give me one time and then they'll immediately start pinging me and following up immediately. Or they'll say like, they wanna talk like in an hour. Like, are you kidding me? Like, no, like I do, like I'm not free, like, you know, willy nilly. So the biggest thing you need to do is give them so many times. I'm telling you, you have to be flexible. If you wanna to get to top of the line and be interviewed first, you better give them a variety of times. And I'll pause there if there's any initial questions on that. No questions. We're just seeing um, it's a lot easier to schedule when recruiters pr provide a link to Calendly. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, Elizabeth is also in HR and internal operations looking for a great opportunity small. Um, so we have HR people on the call as well with whom I know and work with, and they are 
putting themselves out there right now. They are agreeing with what Kelly and Brian is saying. Um, so Brian, what are the rec rec recruiters looking for versus what hiring managers are looking for? That's a, tr that's a tricky one, right? Because I think it depends on which business line we're looking at, right? So if you're looking to work in a software engineering environment or a product environment, that's going to be very different than if you're trying to work for like a highly funded 501c3, right? It is different. I'm thinking that recruiters are really looking at like, what is the past experiences that they have? But I feel like hiring managers are really looking for what is the, where does this person want to go next? And does this position that I'm hiring for really make sense in someone's, you know, career trajectory, right? The other thing though, I would like to also say is I think people are, and this is just a personal opinion. I, I'm not representing my company at this moment. Um, I think people are moving a little fast. I think we are hiring a little fast around here in corporate America in Q4 of 2021. You know, there's that old adage that you should hire slow, fire fast. I just think with all the movement right now that I'm seeing in like this, the software landscape, I think that people are moving a little too quickly. So what I'm going to say to all of you is make sure that you have really thought about where you want to go next. Because if you do get stuck in a role that isn't, it's misaligned or that you were really excited for and you didn't do your due diligence, you're stuck there for a couple of years and a couple of years can feel like a really long time. And so one of the things that I really like is when people reach out to me with like a very thoughtful, this is specifically why this role makes sense with where I'm going next. Here's what I'm going to do on day 30, day 60, day 90. Okay. And even offer a couple really great ideas that you'd like to, when you're, when you're doing that, that kind of helps like with like flipping the script on the interview as well. And I do want to just kind of put one little, I'm kind of going to go off on a tangent real quick. I just want to put out one more piece. I spent 45 minutes last week for an informational interview for someone who works at my company. So someone at my company wanted one of their friends to do an information interview with me. They didn't even send me a thank you email. Can you believe that? So oh, I, can't. That's uh, I mean, I just cannot. And this person was, you know, not right out of college. So it's not like we can say that. So I know it sounds really silly, but I love thank you emails that actually reiterate important messaging that you want them to remember, like what your um, touch off is or your sign off. So like when you do a thank you, it should be authentic, but there should be some bullets. I'm a big bullet person on thank yous. Like this is, this, these are the important things that I want to reiterate to the hiring manager in addition to maybe some thoughtful um, suggestions or recommendations as well. And I just think that that is kind of um, a really great way to personally brand yourself in the job market and also make sure like, cause these emails can be forwarded, right? So it's really good that if you send uh, uh, the recruiter and the hiring manager to thank yous, that they're not a copy and paste job, but they're actually thoughtful. And I just cannot believe that that person ever sent me a thank you email, but I'll, I'll leave it there. I know everyone on this call would always send a thoughtful bulleted thank you email, but I did just want to put that point out there as well. <laughs> yeah. You know, Kelly and Brian and I, talked last week and we were talking about when we don't receive thank you emails and thank you notes, that automatically puts people down on the list. A friend of mine is a senior Salesforce director and she had an opening for a business analyst. She had three people that were equally qualified. She did not get a thank you note within 24 hours from two of them. She hired the one that did send it within 24 hours. So looking for a job is very hard. It's time commitment. It is soul sucking. That is why you have to have a strategy and a plan and take all of these tips that we're giving you, but you have to focus and be very strategic with what you're doing. Thank you letters are a vital, absolute must. Okay, that is me pontificating for you as a career coach. Kelly, what are your thoughts on the difference between what recruiters and hiring leaders are looking for? Yes, great question. Um, I do think that hiring leaders are still looking for the unicorns out there. So while yes, it is a candidate market, they kind of have this attitude of, well, 
all of these people apply to our jobs. So we're going to find the best person um, that checks like all of my boxes. And, but as the recruiter, I'm constantly looking for potential in a candidate, like that opportunistic um, vibe. So while you may have X, Y, and Z, here's where you're trying to stretch and go to. And we're having that deep conversation so I can turn around and tell the hiring manager exactly why I think you're a great fit. And here's, you know, what they can bring to the table here's where they want to learn and grow and all of that. So it kind of goes back to in the initial kickoff call with the recruiter and the hiring manager to for us to build this rapport of what are the hard and fast skills that this person has to have that you just don't have time to train on. Like, and there are a lot of those and that's fine. Um, you can't argue with that, but where are you willing to flex? What are some of the soft skills that are missing on your team that maybe someone else on your team wants to take this mentorship um, ownership? You know, there's a lot of people who want to have more learning and development in their careers, but maybe there's not a management position open yet, but they can develop into a mentor role or also asking the hiring manager, what is your biggest weakness? Like, let's just say, for example, it's Excel. But I found this candidate who's a wizard at Excel. Perfect. Like they're going to help strengthen you um, as well as like you can strengthen them. So just really kind of talking the hiring manager off the ledge of what you're looking for is not realistic unless you want to pay 300000 but we're not in the Bay Area. So that's not there. Um, but just being like real with them and building that rapport. What Kelly just said is a huge nugget for all of you. You can take what she said and turn it around to actually build that rapport with the recruiter to ask the question. And Eva, if you can put this in the chat, you ask the question, tell me about your intake meeting with the hiring leader. What are those soft skills that he or she are looking for? What are those, what makes me a unicorn? Because if you can go in to the conversation with the hiring manager, knowing a little bit more behind the scenes of what those soft skills are, understanding what the pain points are, this is my other coaching for you right now. Recruiters are your business partners. Recruiters demand the respect. We are not paper pushers. We are not someone that you just get through to get to someone. The good recruiters out there know the business. We understand. So treat everyone with respect. Thank you letters for the coordinators for setting up the interviews for you. That professionalism is part of your brand. Take the time to do that because the coordinators talk to the recruiters who then talk to the leaders. And in on my teams at Fortune 50 companies, if I, if I hear anything detrimental or that you were not professional, we take that into consideration and I have given instruction not to hire based off of bad attitude. So I see Brian and Kelly shaking their heads to that for sure. Um, yeah, Kelly, go ahead. I was gonna say, I've rescinded offers before because people have been so unprofessional. So, and just so you know, you kind of go on a little black book, um, black list if you are rude to a recruiter. Um, so again, back to Shelly's point, like just be so professional. Like I am your cheerleader. I say that to my candidates, like tell me what you want and what you need. Do not undercut yourself. Like if benefits are so important to you, let's have that conversation. Within the first five minutes, I'm asking you, like, what are you looking to make moving forward? Because I don't want to waste your time and I don't want to waste my time. I want to really make sure like we are aligned here. And so let's say that you're looking for 10 grand more than what I have in the budget. Don't just, you know, immediately just be like, okay, never mind. This isn't what I want. Or maybe undercut what you think that you want. We know the market. And so like, if you're coming to the table and I'm probably thinking, all right, you're probably making anywhere from like 140 to 150. And then you're saying, oh, I'll take a hundred thousand. That's a big red flag. Like why all of a sudden, you know, maybe, maybe you were really underpaid throughout the entire career. Well, that's my job to 
get you up to market and I don't have to put any notes in the system that you were making a hundred grand. I can literally just put, you're looking for 140 to 150 and then no one will question it. But that comes back to our relationship that you need to like keep that in line throughout the whole process. So when the hiring manager also asks you, what are you looking for? You're saying 140 to 150. Like that is me being your advocate. Like let's get you to where the market is. And so the hiring manager isn't questioning like why are they looking for 40 to 50 grand less. That is a beautiful takeaway. Let the recruiter be your cheerleader. Let them help you know the market. Let them know your story and present you in the best way possible. Be real with us. We want to hire people that we like. We present people that present well, that are going to represent us in the right way. So along with career coaching, I also do part-time executive recruitment on the side. And one of my candidates just got a very nice offer to be VP of sales for an audiovisual company. It's because of these tips. So I please record us. We're going to send the recording out. Um, I'm going to jump to the next question. And Brian, we'll start with you on this one. How do you build a relationship with a recruiter? or a senior HR manager or a hiring manager? Well, I think it depends on how you meet this person, right? If you're out networking at you know, different um, events, that's a different touch point than when you are building a relationship from someone who has sourced you and has reached out in an email, right? And a lot of times these relationships can turn into friendships and that's really what you're looking for. Um, I would say the biggest one is you're representing the recruiter at all times. And so it's super important, right, Kelly? I mean, it's super important that yeah. if I, if so when I'm like, when I was over at Drumfire and I was building out the sales team over at Zoom, I mean, I had, I had a couple of candidates that I was really concerned. I mean, they had everything on paper that I needed, like to like, like look at the order and be like, okay, I think I can get this person through. They have like 70% of what we need. But man, they just had sloppy emails and they just didn't really have it together. And so I kicked them off the island um, and now they're not at Zoom and, and all that good stuff. So um, the big thing is, is really making sure that you follow up and you're not too pushy. I don't care for pushy people. You may have a master's degree or a PhD and you might've worked at Tesla. That's great. But if you're going to you know, be a little pushy with me or think that I work for you, then that's not going to work because recruiters don't actually work for you. They work for the company, um, but it is a mutually beneficial experience. And everyone on this call knows this, that, you know, it helps, it behooves the recruiter to put the right people in place for the client or the, or, or the company. But technically we're not headhunting for you unless you're paying someone to be a headhunter. That's a very different conversation, but you know, that's not what Kelly and I are doing today or speaking about today. So do not be pushy. Don't have an attitude. Humility will drive everything. You know, it's okay to like own your experience, own your worth, but be um, humble about it. That's very attractive to especially someone who is a gatekeeper who's trying to channel people into their pipeline. Um, I could probably talk about this all day, but I'll go to Kelly now just to keep up on time. Yeah, real quick. Um, I know Samantha asked, um, what Brian, what's the difference between being pushy and following up? Um, I'll let you answer that first and then I'll, I have my opinion on that. Oh God, I hope they're the same opinion, Kelly. Uh, but I would say um, one follow-up every couple of days, I think is okay. And if the follow-up is thoughtful and friendly and professional, I think that's great. Like Kelly said earlier in this call, there's a million balls in the air for recruiters. They have multiple roles. I mean, I'll just be honest on this call. The fact that Kelly has 20 roles, I think that's a little too many mm -hmm. um, to be able to manage. Like if she was in-house, I'd be concerned because I really think anything higher than 13 or 14 is really exhaustive for um, a recruiter. So everyone should know on this call, most recruiters should have about 10 to 13, even 13 is getting high. So Kelly, I don't know how you're doing 20 of them, but good luck to you. <laughs> good luck to you on that. Back to Samantha's uh, question. Um, you know, after the interview, you should send your summary notes to the recruiter and that should be before the recruiter contacts you. So let's say you've done your first interview with hiring manager. You should have your notes for your own purposes, right? Because that's how you build your thank you. But it's also how you give your summary to the recruiter so they know what to look for when they do their, um, you know, their debrief with the hiring manager. And then from there, leave it. 
And if you don't hear from that recruiter in three to five days, then you can follow up. So it's all about just that you want the cadence to feel natural. It should have a good rhythm, but you don't want to be like that friend who's constantly texting you all day during the workday, right? Like that's not really what you want to be. So don't do that. Um, Kelly, <laughs> am I wrong or right on some of no, this? No, I definitely agree with that. I would also just call out that just remember this is a number scheme. You might read a job description and this is the perfect role in the perfect company that I want to recruit for. But one of my companies has like 3000 applications in one of the roles right now in most of them. And it's going to be like really, really hard unless you do some really creative things to be, um, you know, get stand out for that. So going back to that is... Yes, follow up with the recruiter like every three days. Um, be super, super nice about it and everything. But also you should be applying to so many jobs and tell everyone in the world that you are looking for a new job. Even if it's confidential, call it out confidentially. I'm looking for a new role. Like the more people you tell, the more people um, that they'll be randomly talking to someone and then, you know, they'll say, oh, I know so-and-so. Um, so yeah, definitely. And then David, to your question, um, you know, you're looking to find a recruit for um, a new VP of software engineering. I think one of the most important things you need to figure out um, when you're talking to candidates is, are they a builder? Do they like to build or execute? There are people who want to come in, roll up their sleeves. They have a playbook. They want to just start from scratch or take chaos and make it streamlined and build from there. And then that is the startup world. Then there are people who just want to come in and execute. That's say working for Microsoft or one of those bigger companies where the processes are completely just built out. Here's what you need to do. Boom, stay in your lane on the software or on the um, startup world, you have to make sure that A, this person has done this multiple times before. You cannot just hire someone who this is, you know, maybe their first VP role. The caveat to that is if they've like worked hand in hand under like another VP and they've kind of been their right person, right hand person. Um, but like, what is their playbook? Literally ask them in the interview process, how would you go about building this out? How are you going to decide what languages we're going to use in the architecture? You also need to be looking at where's the talent, right? Like if you're only recruiting in Denver and you want them in Denver, well, how many Java developers are in Denver versus Python versus, you know, whatever else? Like there's so many questions that um, go into it, so. Right, may I add some additional context? Please. To the, okay, great. So. Our two co-founders, one of them is a, a full stack developer and he's already built the stack and the other co-founder is a product guy. He's also a coder, but not that's not gonna be his main role. He's the product visionary and the architect. And so they've already built uh, an alpha prototype and now we're raising funds and we wanna bring on more than just a VP of engineering because the CTO has a full-time gig. He has a day job as a full stack developer. Yeah. And the other founder really needs like a co-founder, but at a junior, at a mezzanine level, not ground floor, because these guys have built it up till now. We're raising the capital. So we're going to have the capital to pay certainly a market salary, but we're looking for somebody who would accept a little below market salary in return for a meaningful meal of equity. Mm -hmm. So that's hey, more content. Um, I think that you and I should connect, or maybe you, Kelly, and I should okay. connect together um, because we can help you for sure. We have a very general audience today, not just startups. So I want to make sure that we're not just going down um, sure. that. So Kelly and I can probably help you with that. Absolutely. Um, so right. thank you so much for um, the question, and let's definitely get in touch. Um, definitely. Thanks. Okay. Great meeting. So you. I want to talk about candidate pet peeves that Brian and Kelly and I have. No thank you letter would be a huge pet peeve. Not being prepared for the interview and doing your homework. Not knowing the revenue and looking at profitability. Not asking questions to the recruiter to get to know what is the hiring manager looking for. Not coming it's kind of like what Brian was talking about, showing up in a sloppy way. These are huge pet peeves for us. 
So Kelly, I'm going to ask you to take a little bit more on this one. You started talking about this earlier. And then Brian, if you can um, pipe in and chime in on this one after Kelly's done. Yes. So um, I would say the biggest pet peeve it, or one of the other ones is not doing any research on the company. If you are not passionate about the company that I'm interviewing you for, I will not move you forward. I don't want just to talk to somebody who's just looking for another job. You may be so desperate to find a job, but that cannot come off in the interview with the recruiter. You need to tell me exactly why you wanna work for this company and in particular, the role. Um, there's a lot of times candidates will say, like say the wrong company or the wrong job or, oh, I haven't looked at the job description. Let me pull that up right now. Like, no, I am not moving you forward and I will cut my interview short with you because if you are not prepared, then like, again, going back to my representation, every resume or every candidate that I pass along to the hiring manager is like, I have vetted them. And now there are times that candidates like aren't the right fit and stuff like that. But again, like be super transparent on why you want to work for this company, what you're looking for and like what's important to you. Yeah. And I would also say, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, but I find out that someone I put forward doesn't have any questions for the hiring manager. Oh, oh my goodness. So I, this happened a couple weeks ago, not to gossip on this call, but I had a kind of a situation and one of, one of my, um, one of my managers. So as a biz partner, one of my managers contacted me. He's like, oh my gosh, I was interviewing this right new to, we call them new to career employees, people that are, you know, within two to three years of their out of college and into their first role. And uh, when it came to the questions section, which this was like a panel interview, so a real opportunity to ask thoughtful questions, like really great questions that could like really, you know, bring you out of the fold a little bit. <laughs> and he said, no, this seems pretty straightforward. I, I'm looking forward to getting started. He did not get the job, um, just to be clear. But like, you know, it, you, you really don't want to waste that window to ask thoughtful questions. And if you don't understand how the business works or what the revenue streams are, that's a question you can ask. You can say, you know, I did, I did a little um, initial research and in this space, I'm a little questionable. I don't understand exactly what is your ARR or what is your EBITDA or what are your EBITDA goals for Q1? Or how does my role fit in with the revenue of the company or just questions like that. So really having thoughtful, prepared questions um, that also these questions are a way for you to then insert more information about your candidacy and about what je ne sais quoi you bring to this position. And it's kind of like manipulating the interview a little bit. So really use that opportunity to um, your best advantage. And then um, be careful with pedigree. I hope that I'm not speaking out of line here, Fine. but oh, is it okay? Um, I don't care if you went to Harvard. I worked at Harvard, so I get it. I don't care if you went to Yale. But um, know, know your audience. If you're interviewing for someone who went to a, a state school and you're going on and on and on about your private education, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to stop listening. So while it's really great that you went to that private college and you're very, very smart, all of you on this call, everyone is, right? I don't need to hear that. I don't care. It's just kind of an attitude thing. It kind of comes across as entitled. Um, I'm seeing this more and more in my personal opinion, not as a representative of my company. I'm seeing this more and more in my new to career um, employees that come to my company. I'm seeing a lot of, uh, oh, well, when I was at Stanford, I did this at the Stanford Media Lab. And I'm like, I know, but you're 22, okay? So we'll get there, we'll get there. So, you know, I'm not that anyone on this call would do this, but you really wanna be mindful of reading the room, know the audience, and that while you have these accolades from your education, that's really great. We actually got rid of an education requirement at my company. We don't actually care where you go to college. We want to see what you've done in previous roles or what uh, skills that you actually have that we can speak to. So I would just be really careful about reading the room and, and making sure that you don't come across as pretentious. That's really important. That's a pet peeve of mine. You know, I want to talk a little more about that. At our last Colorado Career Connectors, we had the head of military recruitment from Raytheon Technologies. He's a good friend of mine who I hired at Lockheed. He is a good old boy from the South. And he's like, be humble. I don't care where you went to school. I spent 20 years in the military. We want to know who you are as a person. 
that emotional connection, that connection that you make with us as people, that's who we're representing. Now we already know that you went to a really good school. Um, or if you didn't go to school, that's okay too. What Brian said is Uplight got rid of their education requirement because people are looking to hire people right now. But they don't want to hire people who are messy, sloppy, rude, not professional, or have arrogance about them. What he said is that, and Tony, who is the head of military at Relations at Raytheon, you got to be humble. Be humble, be nice, and we'll help you. That is super important. So I'm glad that we talked about those pet peeves. That's awesome. So Kelly, what are the top three things candidates should know to do to land a job? What three pearls of wisdom do you have? Yes. Do you mean like getting, um, actually, no, I know what you mean. Sorry. Okay. okay. I would say be a closer just because you're not in sales does not mean that you should not ask for the job. After every single interview, I even if I, like when I'm interviewing and I know that this person is not the final decision maker, I don't care, but I'm saying, is there any reason why you wouldn't hire me right now? And then you just shut up. You let them talk. And then if they come back and say, well, you know, I'm a little concerned about X, Y, and Z, that is your opportunity to rebuttal. That is, again, your opportunity to get in, tell them why, um, how you could learn it, or, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I actually didn't even mention that in our initial call, or here's an example I could follow up with that. Like, you should be showing us as recruiters that you want the job. Like, you should be dying to work here, not in a desperate way, but in a, I'm so excited. I really, really feel like aligned with this job, et cetera. Cause then I'm going to turn around and say to the hiring manager, this person is so excited to work here. Like let's clear your calendar immediately. You have to talk to them. Last week I hired a candidate within two days. I was so excited about him and he was so passionate that we cleared okay. everyone's calendar. Boom, 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 done. He accepted the offer. He starts on October 25th. That again goes to, you better be flexible in your schedule. We all know that people are working and we get that, but if you want to get to the top of the line quicker than every other candidate, you have to be flexible when it comes to further along in the interview process, especially with hiring managers, especially VPs or CEOs, because their calendars are out of control. And then when you show up to those interviews, it better be worth their time. You know, that like, again, showing your personal brand, who I am, this is why you should hire me. This is what I can bring to the table. That is what I want to know. Going back to what Brian mentioned, what are you going to do in the first 30, 60, 90 days? Like, say that in the interview. I love it. Be a yeah. closer, be flexible in your schedule. And when you show up, you better be professional and branded and know and don't waste anyone's time. Brian, I'd love to hear your top three. Oh my gosh. Um, well, plus 100 to those three. Um, and then just to add a little extra on there, I think just talking about like after the interview is just as important as during the interview, going back to the thoughtful bullets of the thank you and, the, and things of that nature with both the hiring manager and the recruiter, but also having that summary. I, I keep a Google Doc for all my interviews. Like I have an interview at three o'clock. Um, taking so I'm gonna take notes during my interview because I always like to know Kelly knows I do this and it's just a way for me to stay organized because then I'm jumping on to two zoom calls at work and then by the time I get to that thank you letter at six o'clock I don't even I have to know what I was you know there's we, we we shift gears so quickly right that you have to be able to stay organized so that's really important um I would also say that you really want to show up in the interview like I still think people should look good in interviews. Like you should dress up a little bit. You should look nice, but know the audience. If it's a software company, you know, dress, dress, dress for the company's culture. I think that's really important because you would, you want to make sure that you're aligned with, with what their expectations are for the culture. And again, it's part of your personal brand, your polish, but with, with Kelly, I agree, close it, show that you are excited about the job, but that you're not desperate be professional and polite in all of your correspondences, be very organized and thoughtful. This is a really silly one, but the other day someone like misspelled my name in an email. I was like, are you serious? So it's like, just be, know your details, know your attention to detail, make sure that you're, you know, you know exactly what you're doing. 
You don't have any typos. You have no mistakes. Uh, get your time zones right. I know it seems really silly, but it's th that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, you're laughing, Shelly, you know what I mean, right? Like when we're in this remote, well, I mean, I've got people in Boston I'm talking to tonight. I have people in San Francisco later this afternoon. I got to know your time zones. The same thing with an interview, especially if you're looking at a company that is remote first. Um, sounds like a silly thing, but you know, it's all those little details that add up and to get me to that offer. Also, Oh, sorry, Shelly, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, Lisa, on this call, I'm sure you see this time and time again. This is why you are so su successful in resume writing. But the amount of terrible resumes that come through is just baffling. It's like, baffling. I'm just That's like, no one read this? Like, did you even read this? Um, but going back to... Um, you know, in my applicant tracking systems, I do Boolean search strings for keywords and the keywords, I'm going to talk to those candidates first, um, you know, because they have what I want and what I'm looking for. And like, if you need help with your resume, please, please, please talk to Lisa. And I'd love to hear from you, Lisa, what your thoughts are. You know, most resumes I see are awful. They're just so not well put together. There's typos, there's misspellings it's one thing after another and I think I figured out why it's really really hard to write your own material it's hard for me to write my own I have to go to my husband because he always finds stuff that I don't think of um, and that's why I'm so popular and, and other good resume writers because we can help people see beyond how they see themselves and it's really, really hard to write your own stuff. It truly is. It is not for the faint of heart, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. So all of you out there, join Lisa and I for the 25th in two weeks. She's going to be giving a presentation for us. I have seen her resumes. I have had many clients in the past month, like five, four or five in the past month that have raved about her. So I'm gonna go back to the question, my own pet peeves that as the leader of, I used to recruit for like C-suite and directors and above, know when you pause, know that silence is okay for you to think about a question, be comfortable and confident in telling your story, practice your interviewing. Don't assume that you know because you probably don't. And the number one piece of advice is find the pain points or the growth points of the company, focus in on those and how you can be the answer. And honestly, hire some help, get some assistance if you don't wanna be on your own, right? That is what Brian does in his business as a senior. He is an advocate. I'm an advocate for job seekers. Kelly is an advocate for re as a recruiter. This is why we know each other so well. And that's why we have these really quick, fast paced conversations for you because we want you to do your best and land that job. Absolutely. I can't believe it is coming up to time. Is there anything else, Brian or Kelly, that candidates are missing the mark on that would you say, if you could do this one thing, here's this awesome takeaway for you. I would say if you are really on the job market, please put open to new opportunities on LinkedIn. Now, I'm not saying if you if it's a confidential search, don't put like the ribbon on your profile picture, like open to network. Like everyone should know that any if it's a confidential search, any recruiter that is in your company cannot see that you are open to new opportunities. LinkedIn like makes that really secure and safe. Now a friend of theirs could go tell them, um, but really make sure your LinkedIn is looking good, that you have a summary. And honestly, ask people for recommendations on LinkedIn. If I, the first thing I do when I look at someone's LinkedIn profile and I want to send them a message, I immediately go to their recommendations and I will pull a line from someone who wrote something nice about them and talk to them about it, saying like, I really like what so-and-so said about you. It really clearly speaks to, you know, what you're doing today or whatever it is. But when you're asking for recommendations, make sure you're also 
at saying to that person you're asking from, like, I will be more than happy to give you one. Don't make it all about you. Can I leave something? Yeah. The best time to reach out for recommendations is after you've updated your LinkedIn profile and it's shiny and new. Yes. Great call out. And to ask for endorsements for the top three skills. I'm going to kind of leave everyone, you know, with something to think about. Obviously, we've gotten very tactical today, right? We're giving you the real boot camp of like things that you can do after this call to start enhancing your candidacy. But I'm kind of looking, you know, on the, the people on this call right now, and I'm just going to kind of throw something out there. I'm, I'm sorry if I overstep a little bit. But I think that companies are really yearning for experienced people. And I think that there was a time when people were excited for new to career graduates because in, typically in the job market, they can be inexpensive. It's a learning opportunity. They bring a lot of energy and they're vibrant. But also there's a lot of other challenges that these new to career employees come into the workforce. And I'm noticing in my personal opinion that there's a lot of managers in my company who are really just don't have time for training wheels. We move fast. We need people who have a little wear and tear on their life and a little understanding of how the world works, a little less entitlement. And I know I'm stereotyping and generalizing, but I am just being honest here. So know your worth, know your worth. These new to career professionals are asking for $30,000 over the, the salary ranges. You should too. Okay. Everyone on this call has life experience and you should be able to use that. So step confidently in yourself, know your worth. You don't have training wheels, hashtag no training wheels. And I'm hoping that we start to see this pendulum change a little bit in corporate America in 2022. And we start looking at experience again as a plus add over these new to career graduates. So I'll just kind of leave you all with a little of that to think about. Know your worth and leverage that experience in thoughtful ways because the new to career graduates are doing it and they don't even have experience. So you should do it too. And just because you were a manager or a VP at one time does not mean you have to stick with that if you want to go back and be a senior individual contributor, you can absolutely do that. But it goes back to you have to have that story to tell. You have to have like a really good resume that shows that you want to do that. And that's like where the coaching and um, resume writing comes in because like we will help you with that. I hope that all of you have gotten some nuggets that you can take away from today. We will have the recording for you by tomorrow, most likely. Um, Brian and Kelly, I want to thank you so much for, there's, we could talk about this for hours. There's a few pieces that I want to leave you with. It's just like Brian is talking about for new grads. Sometimes in startups, they hire millennials and then they want everyone else to look like them. If you are over 40, know your value, know your worth, ask for what you want. Um, ageism is real. But I have a client that had two offers, she's 65. She had two offers in one day. It's about your energy. We are in a multi-generational workforce. Know what you're worth. It's a candidate market right now. Kelly has 20 roles that she's recruiting for. I have two roles that I'm recruiting for. Uplift, 200 roles that they're recruiting for. So if you need help, ask for help. Hire someone that you trust that can give you great advice. There's a lot of career assistants out there. LinkedIn, Lisa, Carmen on the phone, me, lots of people. And if we're not right for you, we'll send you in a direction that will be right for you because we want you to land. That is why we bring this to you. In the meantime, I'm doing a survey to learn more about what you'd like in the upcoming Career Connectors. We've got Lisa Carmen in two weeks. Next Monday, I'm doing a special edition. It's called Ask a Coach. Please sign up for that. You can ask me anything you want, no judgment. I will absolutely give you all the right advice. In November, we have art articulated intelligence coming so that you can learn more about how you tell your stories in interviewing. I'm working with people to bring you more on burnout, how to get through burnout, how to ask for compensation. This is what's coming up for you. Again, please take our survey. We've got um, lots more coming your way. And next week is Ask Your Career Coach. 
So I see nine, I'm gonna stay on a little bit longer um, in case you have any questions at all. But um, thank you so much, Charity, great to see you. David, I hope to help all of you. Ambrish, love having all of you here. If I know you personally, and if I don't, put a call with me. I'd love to get to know you because I hear about a lot of jobs in the hidden job market and I connect a lot of people. One of them just doubled his income because of the networking through the hidden job market. So that's how it's done. Thank you all so much. Um, Kelly or Brian, any last comments? I would say just be yourself, be true to who you are and let that shine through. Exactly. That hour went by so quickly. Brian, how about you? Do not accept um, the first offer you get. Really do your due diligence on the company. And uh, I, would, I would also say, Lisa, I would love to have you look at my resume, but I'm scared to because I don't know if I can handle your fierce feedback. So you and I should probably grab some cocktails. I know that we're due and maybe you can kind of, you know, help me out a little bit because it is hard. It is hard to do your own resume. It is. It is. It is. So but, the four yeah. of us are going to go get cocktails <laughs> together soon. I promise you. I get the first round because oh, I would we love all that. for all your answers. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, let's do it. And that you guys have fun. Job search is really hard. <laughs> Go exercise. <laughs> Go enjoy time with your people of trust. If any of us can be in your circle of trust, let us know. We're here. Thank you so much. I'll see you next week at Ask a Career Coach. And if you want to chat this week, my phone number is here for you. Contact me. I'm here to help you. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, everyone.